It's a great delight to be with you all, to be among friends. There are so many here. If the lights weren't so bright, I would recognize you. But I've been looking forward to this for a while now, especially the connection with the friends on the faculty and Dr. Aiken, who was my dean for uh, eight, I think, I think eight years, seven or eight years at Southern, the best dean I ever had. And uh, I can understand why people in this place uh, admire and delight to work it for him and for the Lord. I'm extremely honored to have been invited to come to Southeastern to come and speak about a subject that has exercised and inspired me now for almost two decades. I should be forever grateful to Dr. Aiken for encouraging me to develop a course on a biblical theology of worship when we were both at Southern Seminary. That was the beginning of an adventure that led eventually to the book for the glory of God recovering a biblical theology of worship. In 2001, I was flying to Kansas City every Sunday from, for 16 weeks to preach in a large church with three Sunday morning services. I shall never forget when, at a transitional moment in the service, the music and worship pastor declared to the congregation, now before we continue our worship, let me read from a passage from Colossians 3. As if reading and hearing the scriptures are not exercises in worship. This restricted notion of worship is common in our day and it's reflected in the ubiquitous labeling of CDs as praise and worship music, the specification in church bulletins of the period of singing as worship time, the uh, identification of musicians on the pastoral staff as worship ministers or ministers of worship arts. In fact, the worship industry not only tends to equate worship with music, but it equates it with a particular type of music, contemporary praise. Of course, these practices raise all sorts of questions, not only about the significance of other aspects of Sunday service, prayer, preaching, testimonials, but also about religious rituals in the Bible and the Scripture's relatively minor emphasis on music in worship. Not only is music rarely associated with worship in the New Testament, but the Pentateuch is altogether silent on music associated with tabernacle worship. All of this highlights our skewed preoccupation with music in the current conflicts over worship. But the worship issues in the, the evangelical church faces at the beginning of the 21st century are much deeper than differences in musical tastes, which turns out to be only a symptom of a much more serious problem. In her recent book on worship, Edith Humphrey correctly identifies five maladies that plague worship in the North American church. One, trivializing worship by a preoccupation with atmospherics, mood. It's all about how worship makes me feel. Two, misdirecting worship with a man-centered rather than God-centered focus. It's all about me, the worshiper. Three, deadening worship by substituting stones for bread, the loss of the Word of God. Four, perverting worship with emotional, self-indulgent experiences at the expense of true edifying liturgy. And five, exploiting worship with market-driven values, the sign of a true successful worship services, did you fill the building? Well, after observing trends in worship for a half century, I agree with 
Dr. Humphrey completely. But this raises an extremely important question. What is worship? Contemporary discussions tend to begin with the English word worship, which is generally understood to mean to ascribe worth to someone or something. This probably explains why the music industry, in, in the music industry, people and in evangelical churches equate worship with praise. Praise, by definition, involves verbal expressions of worth for someone we admire or to whom we are indebted. Praise be to God. Praise, by definition, involves verbal expressions. The problem is that although this makes sense to us, the Hebrew and Greek biblical words translated as worship in most of our translations do not mean this at all. Through an exhaustive study of expressions associated with worship in the Bible, I've concluded that worship is far bigger than praise. Worship is far bigger than the uh, English word worship, and certainly far bigger than music. To be sure, a recovery of biblical worship must begin with definitions, but both the Greek and Hebrew words usually translated this way have a much more specific meaning than our English word. Both Hishtahawa and proskuneo bear the specific sense of physical prostration before a superior. We'll have more to say about this in a moment. But worship is more than genuflection. It also involves other physical gestures. It involves a disposition. It involves cultic service. And it involves life itself. Indeed, based on the way the Scriptures talk about worship, I've come to understand it this way. True worship. True worship involves reverential act, human acts of submission and homage before the divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation of himself and in accord with his will. Now, this obviously is not so much a definition as a description of the phenomenon that involves all of life, and it calls for a little commentary. First, the Scriptures call for worship that is true as opposed to false. Everyone worships. The problem is that not everyone worships truly. Those who direct their worship to gods other than the God revealed in Scripture or who worship the God revealed in Scripture in ways contrary to His revealed will worship falsely. Whether we interpret if obedience before Yahweh the Lord in everyday conduct cultically or ethically, Deuteronomy 6.25, to walk before Him in truth or faithfulness with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole being demands integrity, consistency between confession and practice, and consistency between what God seeks and what we present. Second, true worship involves reverent awe. Evangelical worship today often lacks the gravitas appropriate to the occasion and the divine auditor who invites us to an audience with him. In Israelite worship, the concern for reverence was expressed through the design of the tabernacle and the temple and the priest's attire, which were all intended to promote dignity, kavod, and royal beauty, tifareth. True worship need not be humorless, but it cannot be casual or flippant. Third, true worship, the true worship of which we speak is a human response. Now, the Scriptures inform us that angelic creatures worship God by their words and by their actions as messengers of God and agents of providence, Isaiah 6. 
and that the entire universe is involved in worshipful activity. Psalm 19, 1 to 6, 148. However, although the scriptures envision the ultimate restoration of fallen creation, its words were intended for human beings and primarily concerned their relationship with God. So here I am not concerned so much with how the rest of the universe glorifies God. That's their business. I'm concerned with how we glorify God, how we worship Him, how we respond to the Westminster Catechism's declaration that the chief end of human beings is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Fourth, true worship involves action. It's not primarily interior as if God is concerned only about what's in our hearts. You often hear that. It's not what I do that counts. It's what's in my heart. What's in our hearts. And it's as if God is disinterested in external ritual or ethical expressions. Now, many aspects of God remain a mystery to us, but biblical religion is not mystical religion nor is it primarily, on the other hand, cultic or formulaic. Some challenge us to treat worship as a verb, which is fine, so long as we recognize that true worship involves actions, actions, it's a verb, that demonstrate covenant commitment to and love for God, and that our daily lives are characterized by reverence and awe before God. As the prophets declare, 1 Samuel 15, 22, Micah 6, 8, and Jesus himself affirms in Matthew 23, 23, obedience to the revealed ethical will of God must take prior priority over cult cultic ritual expression, action in life. Fifth, true worship expresses the submission and homage of a person of lower rank before a superior. While the scriptures deal with covenant arrangements between equals, Genesis 31, 44 and 54, Jacob and Laban, Laban finally had to recognize his son-in-law as an equal. The relationship between God and his people is by definition asymmetrical. By grace, the creator of the universe and the redeemer of Israel invites us to covenant relationship. But this relationship is fundamentally monergistic, instituted from one side. God selects the covenant partner. God establishes the terms. God determines the consequences of the vassal's response. True worship lets God be God on his terms and we submit to him with reverent awe. Six, true worship recognizes, while true worship subordinates, uh, while human subordinates may express their humility before human superiors by bowing and prostration, only the divine sovereign God is worthy of actual worship. Assuming that we understand worship as veneration of the one who is the source and sustainer of all things and on whom we are absolutely dependent, or we could say, to use Tim Keller's word, if you lost it, you couldn't live. That's your God. <laughs> uh, this is the one we worship. This God has graciously revealed himself in the First Testament by name as Yahweh, by actions as creator and redeemer. And in the New Testament, he reveals himself to us primarily as Jesus, the incarnate Son, but also as the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Seventh, true worship involves reactive communication. We could not worship God acceptably if he had not taken the initiative both to communicate with us and to open our eyes and our ears to that communication, whether in creation or history or scripture. 
The universe declares the transcendent qualities and glory of God in a general sense, but only through his specific revelation in deed and word do we learn of his character and attributes. True worship involves communication through action, demonstrating covenant commitment to God and our fellow human beings because he demonstrated covenant commitment to us first. Eight, for worshipers' acts of homage to be favorably received by God, their actions must align with His will rather than with the impulses of depraved human imagination. Forms of worship will vary from culture to culture, but true worship comes from hearts totally devoted to God and determined to please Him. Scripture clearly reveals the forms of ethical worship acceptable to God, and since the New Testament gives minimal attention to the forms of corporate worship, patterns of true Christian worship are not derived from surrounding cultures. Check with Moses on that one in Deuteronomy 12, 29 to 31, where he says, don't go look at how the pagans worship their gods. You're not to do it that way nor are they derived from personal whim, as Moses says in Deuteronomy 12, 8, everyone here doing what's right in your own eyes. True worship is grounded on theological principles established in Scripture. And then finally, true worship involves all of life. We'll have more to talk about this tomorrow, but for the moment, let me just give you a, a, a diagram of the dimensions of worship. And there are three dimensions in this diagram. On the one hand, you have life, whether it is at home or in community or at work or play, all of life is worship. The middle uh, group is cultic service, and here I've got, you know, bigger uh, bunch of subcategories. This is what we do when we gather for formal uh, worship. And then finally, the last category, the dispositional aspects of worship. If one isn't in covenant relationship with God, the appropriate disposition before God is fright. As the guy says in the New Testament, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the only acceptable worship an unbeliever can bring. For us, it is reverence, and it is awe, and it is trust. In fact, I've come to a rather informal understanding of the word yare in Hebrew, usually translated either fright, afraid, or to be in awe. I think it actually means when, when it's used of those in covenant relationship with God, it is Odd trust, not O-D-D, but A-W-E-D, or shall we say trusting awe. This is the disposition that we need. Well, in my two lectures, that's all introduction. We're just getting going here. In my two lectures here, I would like to expand on this description of to worship, true worship by looking at two psalms, both of which deal with cultic worship. That is, the things we do in the presence of God in the sanctuary as a community. Psalms 95 and 24 tomorrow. T -t uh, tomorrow we will see that God's acceptance of one's liturgical worship really depends on expanding the definition of worship to all of life, though both of these concern cultic worship. So let's turn our attention to Psalm 95. I'm so glad we've already heard Psalm 96, which set the stage for this. Scholars refer to Psalms like Psalm 95 as divine enthronement Psalms or divine kingship Psalms because they celebrate in most enthusiastic terms the kingship of the Lord. And there are a whole bunch of these. I have them on the screen. What's common to all of these is their enthusiastic acclamation of the Lord who established himself as king over the nations and king over all the earth. 
Psalm 95 is the second in this cluster of divine kingship psalms that take us from 93 to 100. In the first of these, you know, 94 is missing. It's an it's the outlier here, but 93 and then 95 to 100. Psalm 93, in Psalm 93, the psalmist speaks directly to God, lauding him for his eternal and universal royal rule. In each of Psalms 96 to 99, the psalmist calls on the nations to join in the celebration of the Lord's kingship over all. Although Psalm 100 lacks the formal declaration, Yahweh is king or Yahweh reigns, it clearly continues this theme of the nations shouting joyfully to the Lord as they enter his presence. Psalm 95 is different. This psalm is addressed to Israel, that is, to the community of faith. If anyone will celebrate the kingship of the Lord, surely it must begin with the people of God. If God's people will not worship him, who will? A couple of comments about the style and structure of this psalm. It divides into three parts, each of which contributes directly to the development of the theme of who is this one who is worthy of our worship? First of all, in verses 1 to 5, we have a call to true and authentic worship. Verses 6 to 7b, it's obvious that whoever's responsible for the verse divisions here didn't quite get it. He was doing his homework on the way to church, and at that moment his horse stumbled, and he put the line in the wrong place. 6 to 7b, and then the evidence of true and authentic verse worship verses 7c to 11. As we read these parts, we notice a dramatic shift in mood. Hear the word of the Lord. O oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for we are his. Uh, he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massah in the desert. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who err in their heart. They do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, Truly, they shall not enter into my rest. Did you notice the shift in tone? In the first part, the psalmist pulls out all the stops, calling on his fellow believers to sing for joy to the Lord, to shout joyfully, to approach him with thanksgiving, and exuberant psalms of praise. But in part two, the mood changes dramatically. The excitement and enthusiasm of verses 1 to 5 is replaced by a controlled and reasoned appeal in 6 to 7 to bow before the Lord. The gushing geyser has been replaced by a quiet flowing stream. And then in part 3, the tone becomes somber and actually deadly serious as it, the psalmist warns his people to respond correctly to their worship experience. My purpose this morning is not to work through this psalm systematically, but to reflect on how it might inform our understanding of worship. 
When I read this psalm, I read, I, I learn several lessons. I'm going to spend a lot of time on the first part, which focus on the object of our worship, by which I do not mean the point of it. In grammatical sense, it is, who's the object of the verb when we say we worship the Lord? And then we'll spend very brief time on three or four additional letters, uh, lessons. But let's begin by looking at uh, the first lesson on worship. And that is, true and authentic formal worship involves an audience with a great king by the king's invitation on the king's terms. There is a silly little song out there somewhere. Thankfully, we don't hear it much anymore, but some of us with mature hair might remember. I sing to you, you sing to me. But our audience is Jesus. Really? Who do we think we are? Inviting Jesus to an audience with us. It's fun, something fundamentally flawed. It's but an invitation to an audience with a great king by his invitation on his terms. Well, who is this king? That's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes. Why is this king worthy of worship? Well, there are several reasons. Our psalmist talks about this. The Lord is worthy of worship because he is supreme among gods. Why would you worship something lesser? There's a logic in the way he talks about the Lord in this psalm. After calling on his fellow Israelites to come, sing for joy to the Lord, shout joyfully to him, enter his presence. In verses 3 to 5, he describes why this is such an awesome privilege. The Lord is worthy of worship first because he is supreme among the gods. He is El Gadol. On the surface, that doesn't seem so profound. However, there are a couple of features about this expression we should note. First, the word for God, ale, can be used, understood as a generic designation, simply divinity, capital D. L is often used that way. On the other hand, it is often used as a virtual or ersatz name for God. You know, the expressions like El Shaddai, El Elyon, El Olam, El Elohe Yisrael, El Barit, El Roi, El Bet El. But I think equally significant in Canaanite mythology, which we know from hundreds of clay tablets that were found at Ras Shamra Ugarit, El was the highest god of the pantheon. A lovely fellow, this. Among the host of gods worshipped by the Canaanites, at the top was El, known as the father of years, the creator of all things created, the bull El, the husband of Asherah, and the father of all the other gods. Our text declares, no, Yahweh is El. There is no other god worthy of the title. He is not this otios, senile old man who can't keep control of his family. And if you've read the myths, you know what that's all about. They're forever squabbling. He is El Gadol. And of course, there are lots of texts that feed this, aren't there? Deuteronomy 10, 17, For the Yahweh your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and awesome El. Who doesn't, who is impartial, takes no bribe. Nehemiah 9.32. Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome ale, who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Jeremiah 32.18. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O great and mighty ale, whose name is Yahweh Tsevaot. Daniel 9.4. I pray to the Lord my God, my, Yahweh my God, and make confession. And saying, O Lord Adonai, the great and awesome El, who keeps covenant and steadfast love. This is the God worthy 
of worship. In Psalm 77, 14, the psalmist asks, who is a great ale like God? And the answer, nobody, only Yahweh. Second, is El Gadol? He is a great king above all gods. As if it's not enough just to identify him as great and the ultimate El, he's a great king. And of course, all of these kingship psalms celebrate this. Psalm 96, for great is Yahweh, greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all of the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And there are many other texts we could look at. The Lord is worthy of worship because he is greater than all the other gods. Why would you bother with lesser beings? It's foolish. In the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 10, 17, Yahweh, your God, truly is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awesome El. If that's true, how can worship be casual? Second, well, I had a couple of additional pictures here. This is what people are worshiping in those days, Baal, the storm god. Uh, another image of the storm god, Ishtar, queen, the serpent goddess, all of these worthy of worship. But, of course, you understand when you look at images like this, what Moses was saying in Deuteronomy 4.28. These are gods that have huge ears, but they don't hear. And always prominent eyes, but they don't see. And big mouths, but they don't speak. Israel has a God who has no ears, but he hears everything. Has no eyes, but he sees everything. Has no mouth. Guess what? He has spoken clearly. This is the God we serve. This is my favorite, this happy chap, this one. <laughs> Hittite storm god. Been fun worshiping that guy. I use the term guy intentionally. Second, Yahweh is worthy of worship because he is sovereign over the cosmos. Notice how the psalmist is working. He's greater than the gods. He is sovereign over the cosmos. In verses 45, he gives us another reason. First, he holds the whole world in his hands. What a powerful image, like a young boy holding a ping pong ball. So the Lord holds the depths of the earth in the palm of his hand. Isaiah says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in the balance? Wonderful rhetorical question. Only Yahweh. Second, he owns the mountaintops. Now, of course, the tallest mountain the psalmist would have been aware of was Mount Hermon. He owns that. But of course, there are lots of other mountains. Baal had his mountain too, Mount Zaphon. And you go to Greece, and Zeus had his mountain, Olympus. And you go to the Scandinavian countries, Thor had his mountain on Valhalla. Or you come home with me, and all of a sudden we realize that those mountains are really only pimples. But guess what? I'll never forget the first time I was driving down the highway toward Jasper National Park, and there was Mount Robson in front of me. You have to worship. God owns this. He made it. Or south of the border, Mount Rainier. Our kids lived there for three years. What a spectacular sight. Guess what? The God we worship owns these big things. But it's not just that he owns them, he created them. This leads me to the third sub-point. He is the creator of everything that exists, including us. When the psalmist says the Lord made the sea and his, and his hands formed the dry land, this is a merism for everything. 
taken right out of Genesis 1, 9 to 10. The Lord owns the earth by virtue of his creatorship. He owns us because he made us. Of course, we understand this kind of reasoning. If you build a chair, it belongs to you. It's yours. You made it. If you paint a picture, it belongs to you. If you write a paper and hand it in, we hope it belongs to you. <laughs> Just as a work of art declares the skill and energy of the artist, so the universe declares the glory and majesty of God. Let me in on the most exhilarating experience I've had. Have you ever seen these? Go to the internet and look at and, and, and download YouTubes of the Aurora Borealis. But you've got to see this. There is nothing like when it's minus 40 degrees outside. That's heaven. And you go out in the back after you've done the chores and you lie down in the snow and you watch the heavens dance. Never forget this. All the colors of the rainbow dancing all over the heavens. This was one of the impulses that drove me into the kingdom of God. I thought the Lord was coming. The heavens declare the glory of God. He made it. This is why David celebrates what David celebrates in 1 Chronicles 29. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty, for all that is in the heaven and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you. You rule over all. In your hand are power and might. In your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. And now we thank you, our Lord, and praise your glorious name. I almost become Pentecostal. <laughs> Amen! Hallelujah! Praise be to God. Third, Yahweh is worshipped because he has established a special relationship with his people. Again, notice how he's working. He's greater than the gods. He owns the universe. And guess what? He's redeemed us. I get the feeling this is the climax. This is what really excites him, makes him worthy of worship because he celebrates the special relationship with God. Notice how he talks about this. First, he has rescued Israel from bondage. He makes this point twice, first in verse 1 and then in verse 6. The Lord is the rock of our salvation. That's very strange, isn't it? We usually think of rock as defensive, but here he's God. He, he saved us. I think ultimately this metaphor comes from Deuteronomy 32. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek, and he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. That's why God is worthy of worship. He is our Savior. He rescued us from darkness, the Israelites from Egypt, us from the domain of sin and death. Contrary to the way Israelites might be tempted to think, especially in days of prosperity, they owed their existence entirely to the Lord's creative act. But it's not only that. He has entered into covenant relationship with Israel. In verse 7, the psalmist grounds the call to kneel before the Lord on the fact that He is our God. That's curious. The fact that He calls us to covenant relationship isn't a call to casualness. It's the opposite. Really, kneel before our God. Of course, this is why he brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your, who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Leviticus 22, 23. Numbers 15, 41. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt not to save you. I brought you out to be your God. I am Yahweh your God. And of course, as you know, this expression is only the first part of what we call the covenant formula. I will be your God and you will be my people. 
Third, the Lord is worthy of worship at this level because he has a special, caring relationship with his people. They are his sheep. They are the sheep of his pasture. That's a tender metaphor, isn't it? And of course, the moment you see that, you think of Psalm, Psalm 23. And I tell you, we have been delighting in this dimension of God in the last two months. Even as we speak, my wife is in Augusta, taking care of our daughter's uh, three other kids while our 13-year-old grandson has his last round of brutal chemotherapy for a brain tumor. These have been dark days for us. But oh, how precious has Psalm 23 for become. Even though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness, I fear no harm, for you are with me. Your rod and staff beat me up? No, no, no. They nudge me, reminding me I'm here. Our daughter ends every caring bridge note with, the Lord is near. That's why he's worthy of worship. This is the God who's invited us to an audience with him. This is the God we worship, giving him his status as supreme over all and his gracious saving actions on our behalf. Worship can scarcely be casual. This is an awesome moment. I hurry on to the last four points very quickly. True and authentic worship involves an audience with a great king, too. True and authentic worship begins on our knees in a gesture of submission and homage and physical declaration and unworthiness. This is so different from what we do. We come to church on the Sunday morning and we say, here I am, Lord, aren't you lucky? I could be out golfing. But I've come here. Good for you. How different is this? Of course, we know nothing of this. The interesting thing is the more we talk about worship, the less we do it. For this is what the Hebrew and the Greek words mean. Prostration before God. If you don't get that picture, here's a schematic. The same thing. This is what we do. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Here's an Egyptian one bowing before a superior. And of course, other people know this. You've seen this sign, or this. Wherever we are, at the right time, we worship. In fact, even our ad industries know what worship means. But we don't do this. When's the last time we did this? We used to, when I was growing up, when my mother taught us to pray, we would kneel. Wednesday prayer meeting, we always knelt. But no, we don't have to anymore. We've arrived. God is lucky to have us. There's no sense of reverence and awe, submission, and homage. Third, in true and authentic worship, what the Lord says to the worshiper is always more important than what we say to him. Today, if you hear his voice... It's an audience with a king. Imagine if I were invited to come to Buckingham Palace. Queen Elizabeth, my roots are Canadian. Queen Elizabeth invites me. I tell you, if I were ushered into her room, I wouldn't speak. I would know better. Ecclesiastes 5 has a very interesting text at this point. The wisdom literature has very little to say about formal worship, but all of a sudden, stuck in there, when you come before the Lord, let your words be few. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Guard your steps. The mark of true and authentic worship is a soft heart. Don't harden your hearts as they did at Massa and Meribah. The interesting thing about that generation, A, they were the seed of Abraham, and B, I imagine they were circumcised. 
because to participate in the Exodus and the Passover beforehand, you had to be circumcised, although it never does actually say, I imagine they were circumcised. But here is a bunch that were circumcised, physical seed of Abraham. What does the Lord say? They are a people who err in their heart. They don't know my ways, therefore I swore in my anger. Truly they shall not enter into my rest. Their hearts were uncircumcised. And then finally, the reward for true and authentic worship is the divine gift of rest. This was the Lord's goal. In a restless world, this is his goal for us. As Augustine says, the heart is restless until we find our rest in him. There are so many reasons why the Lord is worthy of worship and what that worship looks like and what we look like after we have actually worshiped. That's the test. He is graciously revealed to himself to us as the supreme over Lord over the universe. But how should we respond to this invitation? Four quick things. First, the redeemed respond to the prospect of an audience with a great king with unrestrained joy and celebration. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Notice, this is not part of the worship service. Did you notice that? This is what they're doing on the way up the hill. Once they get there, come, let us worship and bow down. That's worship. Second, the redeemed respond to the invitation with, great, uh, with gestures of humiliation and submission. Third, they respond with great, to the great king with open ears and tender hearts. And finally, they respond to the invitation with a great king with joyful and unrestrained obedience, motivated by the memory of God's gracious actions and motivated by just, oh, I can't believe he called me. Why me? I went to a one-room country school 15 to 18 students in the school, and one year, six of them were from my family. But I sat in a desk with my cousin. For eight years, we shared a desk. And when I look at where he is and where I am, I said, why me? Why am I here and he's there? It's not occasion for pride. Is the Lord lucky to have me? Where would he be without me? It's the opposite. Dumbfounded. What an amazing God. What a fabulous prospect. If this was Israel's experience, how much more so in the light of Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his Glory! The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of chesed, le'emet, grace and truth. Let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we, King, Lord of the universe, we're grateful and humbled by your invitation to worship. Forgive our arrogance, our presumption, our pride. Drive us to our knees in submission and homage. And drive us out to represent you through our daily worship. For the glory of your great name we ask it. Amen.